Okay. Back to branch prediction. So uh, before we, as I kind of get to slides where we want to go to, any questions before we get started? Okay, so, oh, by the way, if you, if you need, there's a couple more worksheets here. So last time, um, I said something incorrect, so apologies. Uh, so we were looking at this, uh, this last time um, predictor. Oh dear, where did the practice go? Here we go. We're, this is the problem that we ended on um, trying to predict, uh, trying to figure out the branch prediction accuracy for this uh, one bit branch predictor. Um, and we got the answer right because it's, we're going to get, uh, we're going to get nine out of 13, but I, my reasoning was incorrect. So I want to correct that before we go any further. So um, I incorrectly was stating that the that the branch predictor is global, um, and therefore uh, you get a miss you get a a, a misprediction here uh, only on the second, and then you'd also get a misprediction here. So that's not right. Let me go ahead and pull this out and erase that uh, so I can I can show you the correct thinking here. Oh, that's not what I wanted to erase. We'll do that. We'll erase this guy. Okay, we're just gonna leave that one there. Damn it. Um, oh. Let me try again. Why is this not? Okay. Sorry, guys. Whiteboard info. I think it's updating now. There we go. Uh, okay, um, well, I will just point. So the idea here, um, this one, so, so anyway, the, the, the thing that I said incorrectly was that these are, the, the, this one time predictor is global. It is actually as indicated by this table here per branch. So we still get the same result because then you get two misses uh, two missed predictions here on the first and last uh, for this loop, and then on the first and last for this guy as well. Um, but then you don't get anything anything here. Okay. Questions on that before we move on? Okay. So, um, 
there's a bit of a problem with these last time predictors. So if we have a prediction that goes um, from, or we have a branch that goes from true, true to not, uh, or taken to not taken, or not taken to taken too quickly, uh, then we're gonna we're gonna switch to a different prediction too often. Um, so if we have taken, not taken, taken, not taken, we're gonna get zero percent accuracy with that. What does it mean to assume a given code reaches equilibrium or reaches steady state? Basically, it, we're we're saying that once we're you know a k of you know ten or a hundred or something, once we've kind of evened out uh, to a to a um, uh, so not like the first iteration, for example. Um, so the idea is let's add some uh, uh, like hyster hysteresis. I think that's how you're supposed to pronounce this. The idea is that we we kind of um, slow the transition to a different state. So instead of transitioning immediately, let's transition after we see a couple of uh, mispredictions instead of just immediately when we see only one. So this is going to require us to keep now two bits to track history of predictions for a branch. Uh, instead of a single bit. What this will do is it'll give us uh, two states for taken and two states for not taken um, instead of one state. So let's just uh, look a little bit deeper. This is also called bimodal prediction. I don't know why. And just like the, the one bit uh, predictor, we have each branch has its own counter. And the extra bit gives us just a little bit more uh, effectively hesitancy to switch to a different prediction. So if we're in a strong prediction, so if we're fairly confident that this branch is going to continue to be, say, taken, uh, then only one not taken won't change our mind if we're fairly confident that it'll continue to be um, continue to be not taken. So uh, if we have a loop with n iterations, we're actually going to end up with only n minus one now because if we have one misprediction and then a, a, th that won't affect our next prediction. Uh, which will be taken again. Um, we also see that this um, uh, this this pattern still might end up with a fifty percent accuracy. So if we if we're um, kind of oscillating between the two states of taken and not taken, and we don't ever get to a strong confidence in either one of those we're still only gonna end up with 50% accuracy. Um, so the pros to this, obviously we get better prediction accuracy with the additional, uh, uh, um, with the additional bit. So let's just assume now we're up to 90% accuracy, which is pretty, pretty accurate to what what you will see in re uh, real world with two bit counters. And uh, now, I, I don't know if you guys remember, but the CPI from last time, it was like 1.6 or something, 1.06. Now we're down to 1.04, which is much better. Um, the con, however, is more hardware, right? We have to store two bits instead of one. We have to potentially do more, uh, more logic as well. So I think it's useful to look at a state machine for all these. And this is the state machine for our two bit predictor. So the blue states are that we predict that it's going to be taken. And the red states are the ones that where we predict that it won't be taken. So if we are uh, in either one of these two states, 
here, we're going to predict the branch will be taken. And if we're in either one of these two states, we'll predict that it won't be taken. And there's corresponding binary for these, you know, one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, zero. And what happens when we see a taken, basically when we see a branch having been taken, uh, we'll, we'll move towards this top left, basically. This is, um, this state indicates that we're very confident this branch is gonna to continue to be taken. This state over here is that we're very confident or more confident that the branch will continue to not be taken. So whenever we see a taken, we move just a little bit closer to this, this strong prediction that it will be taken. Now, I don't know how well it, you can see this on the on the slides. On, I think it's pretty pretty clear. This is a little bit lighter, and this is a little bit lighter. And the reason is these are kind of uh, weak states. Should the lowest blue Yeah, that's a typo. That should be taken. Uh, so this one should be taken. Yes, that's correct. Um, great catch. I will fix that later. So, so these these two states here are indicating that uh, we're pretty sure, but not 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 as confident in our guess. Um, so it, it will take two mispredictions to not taken and then not taken, for example, or take, not, uh, taken and then taken. Uh, it'll take two times of mispredicting to get us to change our prediction. Uh, here's a, another look at it with some, instead of kind of the more, with, uh, with some less formal language that we can say that uh, the state over here is strongly taken, this one's weakly taken, weakly not taken, strongly not taken. And obviously, you know, if we're in one of these strong states, if we continue seeing things that reinforce our assumption, we're just gonna stay there, we aren't gonna move. Okay, so then the question is, how does this affect the example program that we were looking at. Um, so I'll give you a, a minute to think about this while I try and figure out what's going on. Okay, so what are we what are we thinking? How how is this going to affect our uh, branch prediction accuracy? Any ideas? Uh, does it matter? Does it matter what the initial state is? Yeah, it's not gonna really matter because we're considering steady state and there's enough iterations in all of our loops that we're gonna get to the always uh, strongly taken state by the end of the loop. Yeah, so, so we aren't gonna um, have any problems with where it starts out. Um, 
so yeah, I, I think uh, on, on Zoom, we'd have one mistake per loop and that's correct. So at the, at the very end, we'd continue predicting that it's, it's uh, um, going to be taken and then it's not taken because the condition is false, we fall through. But all that's going to do is instead of instead of changing our prediction entirely to to um, to taken, we're going to go over to this um, weekly uh, uh, or sorry, just changing it all the way to not taken. We're we're going to only go one step over to this weekly taken. So we aren't quite sure. Maybe this branch is going to switch around and now it's going to um, come over here and always be not taken. But we're going to still predict. The next time around that it will be taken and then we'll confirm that oh yep we go back to here uh once we get back up to the the condition again on the next iteration of the loop so yeah 11 out of 13 which comes out to some percentage um that you can calculate yes local again yes yeah. so so yeah apologies for confusing the waters last last lecture I, we're considering local to a single branch. It's kind of funny. The calculations work out either way for this specific example, but that's not true in general. Okay, additional questions. Okay. So, moving on. Is this enough? So, we can get about 90, uh, 85 to 90% accuracy for most programs using this two bit counter based prediction. Which is pretty good, right? You know, this is a this is a B B plus, but is that good enough? Um, so let's let's quantify how bad the branch problem is. Okay. Uh, okay, so they're pretty frequent. Branches are uh, they're fifteen to twenty percent of all of the instructions, because quite frankly computer programs aren't very useful if you don't make any decisions. So um, let's just say that we have uh, our fetch address and um, uh, is determined n cycles into our pipeline processor. Uh, so um, if we have a branch instruction, we don't know whether or not we're going to be fetching the next instruction or wherever it's branched to for n cycles with our MIPS example I think it's you know uh, three right because we have to go from uh, it's the third cycle right on the ALU stage now that's going to be our minimum uh, resolution latency okay now if we just stall so that's our you know we we don't do any prediction uh, it's gonna gonna waste instructions. It's gonna uh, waste compute power, right? It's going to um, reduce our overall IPC, which is just bad, right? So total, we total in total, we will have n times w instruction slots are wasted, uh, where w is our pipeline width, because we're having to stall and not do anything for that many cycles. So again, as we've seen, branch prediction can really help with this. It'll allow us to guess and fill up our pipeline um, with things that we think will be the correct direction um, after our branch instruction. And again, we need to determine where we 
fetch uh, when the branch is fetched. And this is this is critical so we can actually avoid, you know, fetch something that's useful. So how long does it take, assuming we have our five wide superscalar pipeline with now we're going to increase our 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 um, branch resolution like latency up to 20 cycles this is kind of high in modern processors but it's not too high uh, like i said last lecture i think intel's at around 12 to 14. so if we're trying to fetch 500 instructions and we're going with that assumption that we have 20 percent 15 to 20 percent um our branch instruction if we have 100 percent accuracy we're going to be able to fetch all of them in 100 cycles. Um, and remember, we're five wide superscalar, meaning that we're fetching five instructions at a time. So all of our instructions are fetched on the correct path. We have no wasted work. Everything is well with the world. What if we have only 99% accuracy? So 100 go. Um, uh, 100 cycles for the correct path plus um, uh, one wrong path per uh, five uh, per hundred instructions gives us a total of 20 cycles down that wrong path because that's the uh, um, how wide our pipeline is meaning that we get 120 cycles this is this is already 20% more instructions fetched than before. So that's kind of bad. Again, this is a superscalar pipeline, so we, we have to multiply. Um, uh, we're fetching all five at, a, at the same time, um, five instructions at the same time, uh, which allows us to only you know, incur this, this one uh, 20 cycle penalty for the, the, the five uh, missed instructions. And if we have 98%, again, we're, we're now doubling the penalty. Now we have 40 cycles. This is again 40% extra instructions set. And if we're only and if we get down to 95%, we're already at 100% more instructions fetched. Uh, again, this is mainly due to the length of our pipeline as well as the, the width doesn't help as well so um that's not good right uh, we don't like fetching instructions that we don't actually need so this is going to require us to kind of make some some new uh, innovations okay so the innovation by the way if you couldn't tell from this slide here is that we're going to have global and local branch prediction and we'll talk about what this means so the first realization that we we have is that a branch's outcome can be correlated with other branches outcome and this is what's called global branch correlation realization two is that a branch's outcome can be correlated with path outcomes of the same branch, um, other than the outcome of the branch uh, last time it was executed. This is called local branch correlation. Okay, and we'll talk about what each one of these means. So let's look at global branch correlation first. So if we have, uh, let's just say a history of the past five um, branch outcomes in our execution path, um, that may correlate to what the next outcome will be. So for example, if we have a, an if statement or we have a conditional, where it's condition one, and then we have some, some logic in here, and then we have another if statement, which is condition one and uh, condition two, maybe this should be or. Um, if the first branch is taken, then the next one will also be taken. Obviously, let me 
I'll, I'll change this to an or for now because this is this is that, that will guarantee that we'll we'll actually take this second branch right so there's some correlation between branches so this is instead of just local to a specific branch we're looking at uh, the the previous branches that have happened through the execution of our program so if this one's true then this one's definitely going to be taken here's another one where if the first branch is not taken so if we never set a to two assuming that a is set to zero up here um, then this branch will definitely be taken so um, if condition one is false a equals zero is going to be true again like i said assuming that a was initialized to zero so this is an example of this global branch correlation idea Here's another one. So say, say we have branch X and branch Y with condition one and condition two. If both of these are taken, meaning uh, that they are false, because uh, oh, sorry. So, so this one here, there, there, I, um, taken means that it's false. So, so if this one's false, then obviously this one will be false as well. Conversely, if this one is 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 not taken, this one will also be not taken. So that this is actually both directions. Here, if we have taken uh, for both x and y, it means that both condition one and condition two are false. So obviously, this branch z will also be taken. Uh, wait. Oh, and if this, if either one of these are taken, then this entire thing becomes false. If both are, um, uh, I think I missed a not. Sorry, guys. Uh, this is what happens when I do slides at midnight. Um, if they're both not taken, it means that they're both true. And then Z is also not taken. So apologies about that. Insert a not here in your brain. Okay. Sorry. A little bit convoluted here. Any questions? You said taken and false. Yeah. Taken is false, yeah. Yep, because you skip exactly because you skip the code underneath. So if either one of these are taken, this one's going to be taken. Um, because one of these things in the end is going to be false. Okay. Here's another example. Uh, this is from a, an actual um, uh, benchmark. So we have branch one, branch two, and branch three. Um, branch one looks at this variable AA. Branch two looks at DB. Um, and if branch one is not taken, Again, not taken means that the condition was true. So we didn't, we didn't skip over any code. Uh, then AA is going to equal zero. And if B2 is not taken as well, so we go ahead and set BB equal to zero. If both of those are true, then we definitely take B3. Uh, because, well, zero does not equal zero is going to evaluate to false. So we're going to take this branch to skip over code inside of this if statement. So these are three examples of where we get this global branch correlation idea. So let's try and capture this. Let's try and 
take advantage of this correlation. And, and the idea will be let's associate our branch outcomes with a global taken, not taken history of all of the branches. Um, so in other words, we're gonna make a prediction based on the outcome of the branch the last time the same global branch history was encountered. So if we saw that globally, we've taken on the last five, uh, five branch instructions, we're going to maybe predict that this next one will also be taken. Okay, so what, how, do we, how do we do this? How do we actually accomplish this? We're going to use a global taken, not taken history and keep track of that in a global history register. So this will just be a sequence of, of taken, not taken bits indicating our global history of, uh, of, which, of which direction we've gone on the past however many branches. Uh, we, can, we can change that number depending on how much hardware we wanna use and, and other factors. Then we're going to use this register to index into a pattern history table. This pattern history table will record the outcome that was seen for each one of the different options in our global history register in the recent past. So now we have this global history branch predictor. It uses two levels of history. It uses the history that we have from the history register. And then we use the his, actual history for that pattern in our pattern history table. So let's look at an example. I think it's, uh, it's useful to look at these diagrams and then uh, kind of work through what it, that, uh, that means. So say we have our global history register over here. It's in bits, doesn't matter how many. I mean, it does, it'll depend, it'll, determine how large this pattern history table is, but um, we can kind of vary it uh, within reason. So if we have that, uh, we have taken, taken some other stuff here, taken and then not taken, what we'll do is we'll use this to index into our pattern history table. Uh, so, Say we go to this index. At that index in the pattern history table, there's going to be a two bit counter. So we're going to have a counter that is telling us last time that we had this pattern where taken, taken, dot, 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 taken, 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 not taken, we predicted something, right? Whether that's uh, taken, not taken, weekly, not taken weekly taken, uh, this is exactly the same as we've seen before, the same um, saturating counter uh, for each of these history items. Okay. A any questions before we go into this example? So we're going to look at this code here. Okay, so we have um, a, a for loop that's going from i equals zero to i less than a hundred, and we have another for loop in here, which is um, the one that we really care about, uh, which is going from j equals zero to j uh, is two. And so after our initial startup time, so once we get it to, you know, iteration two, three, four, et cetera, of our outer for loop, what we're going to have is the following behavior, assuming that our, uh, um, uh, assuming that our global history register here is four bits, this is what the behavior will look like. So when we hit the J less than three, 
condition the first time, we're going to see that j is 1. Um, because this is after we've executed the loop once and done the first increment, j is now 1. And what does our global history register show? Well, uh, the last branch that we did was for this outer for loop. And it was taken because this outer for loop pretty much always taken, you know, until the very end. The one before that was not taken because that was exiting out of this inner for loop. And then the two right before that were taken because they were they were looping around in this inner for loop. That's where we get this uh, history. And the result, so this would be what we store over here in our pattern history table for that particular uh, global history value is taken. So if we see this history of 1101, we're going to predict, oh, this is, this is taken. Um, and if we then go to the next iteration of the loop, now we're shifting everything over to the left by one. And now uh, you can see it also in this diagram, the kind of uh, rightmost bit is indicating what the last branch did. And the last branch was taken. So we add the one here and we shove everything else to the left, get rid of the most significant bit. And now we have another pattern in our global uh, um, pattern register. It's 1011. And in this case, we predict that it's going to be taken. This is our second loop with j equals 2. We do the same thing. It's taken, we add a one to our uh, register, and then uh, we get to the next iteration of the loop where, where j equals three, and our pattern is zero, one, one, one. So again, the not taken is um, uh, all the way from the, the, the last time that we didn't take on, on, on this uh, for loop. And then we have three taken in, in the meantime. And we predict this is going to be not taken. Okay. And then at the very end, we have our last branch. Yeah, it's, it's this global history register. So the idea is this is this is talking about like. Uh, as well as well as the um, uh, the actual register, and then also it's how we index into our pattern history table over here. Does it matter how many bits it's storing versus the loop? Does it matter how many bits it's storing compared to the loop? Yes. We'll we'll talk about that in just a moment. Actually, um, I want to. I'll finish this up. And then we can we can discuss that. So after we don't take on the 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 um, the last iteration of this inner for loop, we're going to arrive at the outer for loop branch, and this one's usually going to be taken, right? Except for the last iteration, like I mentioned. Uh, and we will see that one 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 zero. So this is the not taken from the last iteration of the inner for loop. And then these are the takens from the previous iterations of the inner for loop. In this case, we usually take, we usually go back up to uh, the top of this for loop and, and start over again. So the question that Evan raised was, does the size of your register matter? Yes, um, it'll make a big difference. If you, if for example, we only had two bits for our global history, we'd see a much different uh, behavior here. For example, both uh, of these conditions, j equals two and j equals three, would end up in the same index. They'd both be one, one. 
so we would have them mapping to the same thing in our pattern history table and we wouldn't know which one to predict we'd be oscillating between the two probably can it be too big yeah probably right like uh um for a few reasons right it, it could just be too big because well you have to store enough to be able to index into this pattern history table this pattern history table has to be big enough to have every single index that's possible and so that's that's increasing exponentially you know five isn't like that big of a deal that's only 32 entries here but you know once you get up <clears throat> once you get up to like 10 20 then you're then you're getting real big um, and probably not useful anymore oh okay i see so why do we need this table if we already have this notion of history well it looks like you're basing it off what you did right so so we aren't okay yeah the, great question so the question was it looks like we're basing it off of you know this this guy here or or this guy here what our prediction is so we're actually basing it off of the uh, two bits that we're storing in the pattern history table at the index referenced by the global history register. So we, for example, if we have a history of, let's just say four takens in a row, and then we index down here to our two bit counter, and the prediction is that it's not taken. Maybe this is just kind of a, uh, a for loop that is that size, right? Then we'll predict that it's not taken, even though our register has all taken. That help. That so yeah, we aren't looking at this most significant bit. This doesn't have any bearing on the actual uh, uh, global history. We're 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 adding the actual result of the previous branch. So here, right? So we uh, between between all three of these, we we took on the last branch. So we take, we go here, taken one, and then not taken indicates that we, we should just shove a zero here. And that gives us this is our history. And then that's that should be disjoint from your prediction. Your prediction can can vary using that two bit counter thing, but you have to look at the history and then get your prediction from the two bit counter. Um, you can't just use the the bits here. Uh, let's let's uh, let's jump into this example and we'll kind of work through a couple of them together and maybe it'll clarify some things. And I'm going to figure out how to um, well, how do I just write stuff? Oh well. So we're gonna look again at this example that you probably hate by now. And I gave you a nice little table that is formatted pretty similarly to what is in the slides. And what we're going to look at is what is our global history uh, and as well, what is our result? Okay, so the first thing to do is at this I 
less than four. First i less than four check. So this is after the first iteration of this loop. Oh, I should have. Uh, what did I say? I guess I didn't actually specify. Let me check. We'll go with actually five. I'm not sure, does it actually change? Yeah, let's go with five. Let's go with five bits, okay? Does the table entry change with each touch of the table entry also? Yeah, so it, it will change just like, um, uh, according to our, our state machine that we had way up here. Oh dear. This state machine. So so each, each entry of the pattern history table will have its own state machine indicating which way we expect to go. And there was one other question when you say table entry you mean entry in the PHT. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so What does our global uh, history register look like? Well, the first question asks, and let me let me change this to a one. So that's what matters here. Um, what was the previous branch? Well, the previous branch was from here. This is the previous branch that we evaluated. This K. Um, less than a, a big number. I don't even know what it is. Was it taken? Well, yeah, we, we looped back around. So that's going to be a one in the least significant bit of our register. What, what is the this one? One. So, so, so this is because we've, uh, we've reached this effectively. Um, which is after we've done the increment. So I just was off by one. Classic, you know, CS major, right? Being off by one. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So then the question is, let's look back one more branch. What was the branch before we took this branch back up to the top? Was it taken or not taken? Which branch was it? Which condition was it that we evaluated? The last check here, and was that taken or not taken? Not taken. Yep, because we exited out of the loop, so that's going to be a zero. Then we look back one more. What is that one going to be? Taken. And we're going to actually get three taken because this is in the middle, these three here are kind of in the middle of our uh, second for loop. Okay, so we just keep taking until the very end, and this is the very end where we have a not taken. And what is the result? So this one is taken. Um, so I'm just looking at this, this test, right, kind of, and seeing that when I, uh, when we do this I less than four test and I is one, well, that's going to be taken. We go to the, yeah, so it's not based on this or anything, it's not based on anything in the register. It's just based on the actual evidence of what happened to that branch. Okay. 
I'll just skip this line because we don't actually need it. I'll fix the table. Because I, I, like I said, off by one and I forgot this one can also go. Oh, that was, I shouldn't look at, this, at the slide and then do my drawing on the, this screen. It just doesn't work. Okay, so the next question is, what does our register look like on this iteration of our first for loop? Well, let's talk about the uh, the register first. What is the contents of the register at i equals two when we get to the second iteration? One one zero one one. Yeah. So one one zero one one. Apologies for the drawing. I'm having to use a touchpad today because Wayland. Uh, and this one's also taken. And the reason we get this is, well, the previous branch was taken, so we just shove that taken prediction to the front of our register and shift everything over to the left. We're going to do the same thing again. One, zero, one, one. One. And what do we predict here? Yeah, taken again. So this is just in the right in the middle of our loop. And then this one where I equals four, a register is going to look like this. One. One, one, one. I'm actually wondering if, give me one second here. So, so I, I stole this problem from Dr. Wu's slide but I, I don't think I actually specified how many, oh yeah, five bit histories, cool, cool. So I, I did see that and I just didn't copy it over because I forgot, okay. Okay, so what's our prediction here? Uh, well, result. So, so our, our result and our prediction kind of will correlate, right? So if we see that there's, you know, if we always, whenever we see this pattern, we always see the result of taken, our prediction for the future, whenever we see this pattern will also be that we take. And likewise down here, if we have, when we see this pattern, what are we, what is the result gonna be? And then what is our, our prediction for future times we see this pattern? not taken yeah so that's the end of this loop well we 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 are looking at the result of the test okay. but we were also looking at We we're we're looking at the five bits for all of these. As we fill out the table, we'll notice that there's a couple of collisions, which maybe will clarify some things. Um, yeah, I think, I think what we do is the result for prediction because those are not always. Important. Yeah, so the result influences the prediction. I guess is a better way of saying it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the result is going to change. Oh, I guess I'll just stop at this one. It's going to do, you know, either move it over here 
keep it over here. You know, it'll move it around in the state machine to a different prediction or to the, a, a different a different node potentially. For whenever the next time is that we see a, the, the same the same history, we see the same pattern. Um, guess what? We're going to copy and paste because this is identical to what happens down below. Almost. Well, yeah. Let's actually not copy paste. That's going to just be a disaster. So, um, yeah. What happens when we get to the first iteration of our J loop? What does our global register look like? Our history. All ones and a zero on the right. Yeah, so it's this guy. Three, four, and then a zero. And what are you, what do we, what is the result here? Take in. Um, yeah. Now, here's where we get the first same history. Okay, so because we took, we're going to end up with a one in the next, uh, in the least significant bit the next time around. So we have now one, 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 zero, one. Hopefully, you can tell this is the same as this one. And the question becomes, what is the result of this one? And how might that influence our predictor state machine? So this, this one is taken as well, right? So since they're both the same result, what's going to end up happening is we'll have let me draw our 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 state machine over here um let's call this taken and we'll do this one as not taken and then just know that these are the weak versions of them corresponding uh the corresponding ones so initially, wherever we are, um, let's just say um, that at this global history register, we're in this state to, to begin with. After we see this history and it's taken, now we're up in this state up here. And then we see the taken again, we're gonna end up in really strongly taken. Uh, so this will be like one one in our pattern history table. Uh, at this index, indexed by the um, by the register. That makes sense. Any questions? Okay, so I'm uh, moving on. Uh, let's let's just fill in the rest. So for for this this one here, I or j equals three, we're going to end up with another one one zero one one. Again, this is the same pattern that we saw up here. Luckily, it's both taken, so we'll we'll just get into the strong taken state, and then we get one zero one one one. Same as this state here, and this one's also taken, so hooray! And then we get to a problem. So J equals 
five. Am I, am I off by one? I can't tell. Three, four, no, okay, cool. One, 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 one. I guess I should have added rules in between each one to make it a little bit easier, whatever. So have we seen this history before? Yeah, we saw it up in the upper for loop. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it'll also depend on how it <laughs> how it gets compiled. Yeah, it'll depend on a lot of things. But yeah. Like one yeah. Of one of those is always going to get be incorrect the actual if you want to look at the state then then that's a that you you know that would be a different question but it, one of them is always going to be wrong for sure which one is wrong and which state you're in when it's wrong it doesn't really matter as much as that you're going to be wrong half the time so this one is taken in the second for loop at j equals five, we're actually taken, even though the last time we saw this history, we were not taken. And so to, to your question, Evan, right? Here's an, an example of when our history kind of, you know, this, this bit doesn't affect this one, for example. Um, so this bit here will just affect the index that we go to in our pattern history table. Yeah, so yeah. these bits keep track of the pattern. These, it, these, this table is basically a mapping of pattern to predictor. But it's an implicit because it's just an index because it's nice like that. So what, what we're doing is we're looking to see if anything is And then looking at the prediction. Right. And, and we're always going to have some prediction. Maybe we initialize it to zeros or one zero or one one, whatever we we initialize it to. That'll be our initial prediction. But for this case, all we care about is what happens once we get pretty deep into the pipeline. Okay, so I have some questions on Zoom. I'll try and get to. Can we be strongly taken slash not taken at all? since those two always contradict each other. Well, it could if it started there. If we started uh, for, for these for these two, I assume we what you're talking about. Um, if we started at always not taken, then then it would just go from all uh, strongly not taken to not taken and then back to strongly not taken. So it would just kind of oscillate. Here we are in strongly taken as we've had enough takens in a row to push us there in the loop. However, I think strongly not taken would really happen if we just have a bunch of escapes in a row that aren't taken. Uh, imagine if we see strongly not taken in the for loops. So, okay, so, so, so you will see strongly not taken in for loops, especially that stuff like, you know, the this is kind of the beginning of our for loop right so this is going to be strongly not taken because we won't ever have a situation where we see this pattern and it doesn't end up with taken or this pattern right for that matter so uh what state should we assume the t 
two-bit counter entry start at, or would that be specified? So uh, wh where do we start our two-bit counters? In this case, it actually doesn't really matter for the overall branch prediction accuracy. Uh, if it does matter, I'll specify it. And if it does matter, and I don't specify it, then I'll make sure that either one is right. <laughs> um, but for for the for the, for our specific case here, it's not going to actually matter. Um, okay, I think I think we have the idea here of of what what is going on. So I want to hop back to the slides. Oh, that's. Uh, a little bit too far. What are we saying the whole accuracy of that instrument? Oh yeah, we should probably figure out the overall accuracy. Okay, so 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 the question becomes where are we gonna mispredict? Um where are we gonna mispredict? I think every time through the while we are going to miss the zero one one no, zero and all one uh, in either one of one or other spot, right? We're gonna miss in one of these, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you'll I think you'll always miss in J of eight. Um because it's gonna have all one, right? In the register. Yep. So then you know right. all, all three of these are gonna have uh all ones in them and so since there's three three proofs that we're taking on all ones then we're always going to miss on j equals eight because that's the only case where we have three we have strongly taken but we don't take um but once we get back around and we have a bunch of all ones again it'll be back to back to normal um and it'll be correct for for those those um i guess it's what Two times uh, before like that one time of not taken doesn't skip the bottom. Right, it's going to be it's going to be a strong taken, but it'll, you know, uh, drop to, weak. Drop to weak, weak taken and then back to strong taken once we get back to J equals six again. So we'll have a miss here. We'll have a miss prediction on on fourteen, and we'll have a miss prediction on either this one on 11 or on what five so two misses jack i guess if you're like in the in the two in between states, you would miss both. Yeah, so let's just assume, I, I guess we do have to assume for this one that, that it's zero, zero or one, one. Uh, yeah, great questions. So is our two-bit counter here dependent on our, G, uh, our GR or whether we have recently taken slash not taken? Both. So our, <laughs> this is called a two-level predictor for a reason. So we actually, there's a, there's a bit of misdirection between the actual history, which we store in our register and our prediction, which is stored in our pattern history table. Um, and those two in combination give us our prediction. We can't just look at the global history register and know what our prediction will be. And also we can't just look at the pattern history table anywhere random and know what our prediction will be. We have to use the global history register to find which entry in our pattern history table to look at.
Um, let's skip that for now. We'll come back to it. And we'll talk about this. So let's, you know, um, let's think of some, some more ways of adding context to our predictors. Um, because that's really what's happening with these global predictors. We're adding additional context of what's happened uh, beforehand. And uh, a great example of what we could add as context is the branch address itself. Um, maybe we can just XOR it with the branch history register and then use that in our pattern history table. So we just kind of um, combine uh, both the GHR as well as the PC with an XOR. This has more context information and probably is going to distribute out our pattern history table a little bit more um, as far as uh, utilization, because we have an extra hash effectively to distribute. And we all know that you know the better the hash, the better utilization we get of a hash table, which is effectively what this pattern history table is. Except for it's not fancy, like you know, real software hash tables, because this is in hardware. Obviously, the downside is more latency. You know, this takes this takes work. You know, anytime we do something extra, it's going to take more hardware. Okay, um, I think we'll stop there, um, and this will be the last thing that is fair game for the exam. Let me make a note of that real quick. As far as the exam goes, um, uh, it's on the 22nd, as I mentioned. Um, and it'll cover anything that we've covered up till this slide. There'll be a lot of conceptual questions because you have so much time to do it and it's kind of pointless to ask you trivia questions. Um, but uh, one, one feedback that I got was like, how, how do we integrate the kind of math with the conceptual stuff? And here's what I'll say. All of your um, answers should be backed up by some sort of argument that probably will involve math, something, one of these quantitative analysis ideas that we have, whether that's, oh, the CPI will increase, so that's bad, or that, oh, look at the speed up compare, comparing these two machines. Um, that's what I want as far as these answers. I want to see some like uh, uh, quantitative analysis indicating whether. Uh, the trade-off is worth it or not. That's going to be most of the questions. It's going to be a lot of trade-off questions. Um, another thing would be like suggest an optimization um, that could could improve a, a, a particular system, and then you would also have to show that oh this would pr this would um, uh, have these pros and these cons, for example. So I hope that gives you just a little bit of context on the exam. I'll, I'll, uh, obviously, you can, you can ask any questions on Piazza as well. So again, sorry for keeping you a minute late. I will see you all next week. So something that sounds like less like, you know, how many tax lines, blah, blah, blah. And more like the first couple of questions on this last homework, like what happens if the cat is too big? Right, right, right. It's going to be a lot closer to those what happens if the cash is too big questions than calculate the size of this, you know, the, the cash lines. You know, there may be a couple questions like that because I need something easy to grade. But uh, can we expect a practice set? Uh, what I will do is I will try and get you a, a list of problems from the book. I, I, I can't promise that I'll, I'll get that. Um, but I'll, I'll apparently it's supposed to snow this weekend, so maybe I'll have some time. Right, thank you.
I'm not going to write the test before the review session because, well, so, so it's a philosophical thing because I, I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to do a review session where I'm holding back information yeah. from you guys. That's why I did, this is also why I decided to, to, to give myself an entire weekend to write the test <laughs> um, and to torment my TA who has to, you know, test the test. Cool. Any other questions on Zoom? Uh, I have a question about the first uh, part of the worksheet, if, if you have time. The first part of the worksheet, okay. Um, so for the, for the first question uh, of the dynamic branching part, uh, I, I don't understand uh, the change you mentioned at the beginning of the class. I think the last time the result- ah, so, so, so. So it's actually on on this one that I yeah we were talking about yeah okay so um, great question so I'll scroll down here to look at this assembly what I had said last class is that we keep track of this one bit predictor globally mm -hmm. meaning that we have to look at all the different branches and see what they resulted in right uh, however that's not the case we look at just each branch individually branch instruction instruction individually each one of them has a one bit counter oh okay i see same with a two bit counter so uh, i see i see okay that that makes sense now thank you great glad to answer that any other questions Cool. We'll call it a day.